distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Luan Ismahil. I'm the executive director of the Convergence Science Network. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this first and special event of 2018. Since 2008, the Convergence Science Network has invited research scientists to publicly share their knowledge, ideas, and exciting advances in the fast changing world that is biomedical science. This evening will be no exception. Supported by dedicated sponsors, the network has held over 100 events, including our annual showcase event, the Graham Clark Oration, and attracted an audience of over 32,000 people. We are proud of the role we have played to share new research ideas and discoveries with the public, encouraged conversation, and inspired the next generation of scientists. The network's activities have played an important role in maintaining and growing the public's trust in our bi biomedical researchers. Sir Paul Nurse, former president of the Royal Society and currently the director of London's Francis Crick Institute, put it best when he remarked on the need for scientists to be engaged with the public, and I quote him. Ensuring trust in science is not just a question of how scientists behave, it is also a matter of how society views science. And that is shaped largely by how scientists interact with society. I'd like to express our gratitude to this evening's speakers for their commitment to be here to interact and share with us. Professor Jennifer Doudner and Professor Kevin Esveld have demonstrated that not only are they exceptional scientists, but that they have a commitment to engage publicly and earn our trust in what they and their fellow scientists do. On your behalf, I'd like to thank them for their dedication, commitment and service to society. I'd now like to introduce your host for this evening. She's an ABC science journalist and presenter of the Science, Technology and Culture program on ABC Radio National Science Friction. Uh, she was previously the presenter of ABC's flagship programs, Life Matters and All in the Mind. Please give a warm welcome to Natasha Mitchell. Thank you. Hello, hello. What a wonderful turnout. This is an extremely exciting event to be part of and your turnout indicates that I think you feel the same way, yes? Yes. 18 years ago, hard to believe, Bill Clinton, a president, and a prime minister, Tony Blair, joined two scientists, Francis Collins and Craig Venter, to announce that the first draft of the human genome had been decoded. And that was mighty big news. What followed, of course, was a lot of hope. Many of you in the room were involved in that work or you were patients who were keenly awaiting what it might offer. There was also a lot of hype, though, wasn't there? We were told that the age of personalised medicine was about to arrive, that we were on the cusp of a potential revolution in the diagnosis, prevention and treatment of human diseases. And we were also told that we were over 90% chimpanzee. And of course, in the 18 years since, the age of personalised medicine hasn't swept us off our feet yet. We know that discovery is a really slow burn process. Translation into clinical reality can be equally slow. But I would say, and I'm a science journalist and my kind of hype radar is very sensitive. I'm always looking out for spin and trying to avoid it personally, but the hype now feels more real and it feels more valid and it feels full of urgency because in just a couple of years through this set of really dramatic developments and brilliant basic science, the gene editing technique that scientists call CRISPR has landed in labs around the world with an absolute bang. With this tool, scientists tell me all the time that their research agendas changed overnight. 
not just almost overnight, in some cases it was practically overnight. And of course, there's now hope for gene therapies. It's powerful, it's incredible, it's very exciting. CRISPR allows genes to be deleted, to be edited, to be replaced. It's cheap, it's quick, and it's relatively easy. It allows us to investigate the role of genes in diseases, disease development, in human development, and of course, there are hope for therapies. So this is a, a very interesting, phenomenal time to be alive. But of course, this development is raising all sorts of questions, and many of you submitted questions as part of the planning for this event. Thank you, we got hundreds of your questions, excellent questions, questions like, should we limit science? How should we regulate it? Is CRISPR really ready for use in clinical trials on human patients? Should it be used on human embryos? Should it be used to edit and alter the germline, eggs, sperm, embryos, and change, as it does that, what gets inherited by future generations? In other words, changing the course of human evolution using this new tool. Will it be used one day by IVF clinics to edit human embryos for desirable traits, to remove genes implicated in a disease? Who will get to decide what genes stay and what go? Who will have access to the technology and who won't? So, we have two absolute giants in the field, no less than the co-inventor of CRISPR herself, Berkeley's Jennifer Doudna, UC Berkeley, and MIT's Kevin Esfeld, who's been a trailblazer in developing CRISPR as a tool to potentially eliminate insect-borne diseases like malaria or invasive and pest species through what are called gene drives, and you'll hear all about that. Kevin's also pushing for a radical transparency in the way that science gets done. This is a very interesting case that he makes. So, both of the scientists tonight, Jennifer and Kevin, are very committed to pushing for a very public dialogue about the ethics of gene editing. So tonight will be very much about your questions too. They'll be speaking each for about 25 minutes each. Then we're gonna open up four microphones in the room, two here, two up there, and we want you to go for it. Ask questions, share your thoughts. So Professor Jennifer Doudna, she is Li Ka Shing, Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical Health and Health Sciences, Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology and of Chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley. In 2012, life as she knew it changed forever. After she and her collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, worked out the incredible mechanism of CRISPR-Cas9. And it's a story she tells in her new book, well worth a read, with her colleague Sam Sternberg, A Crack in Creation. And all the prestigious awards and accolades have come since, of course, from her peers and the public. Please give her a very warm welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Melbourne. It's uh, my first trip to Australia. It certainly won't be my last. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and certainly all of you for, for coming tonight. I'm, I'm here, uh, you know, on a, I, I was attending a scientific conference and um, we're, we're, you know, we have this opportunity right now to talk about a moment, kind of a proverbial moment. We're sort of at this extraordinary time in human development when human beings now have a convergence of technologies that allow us to read, write, and as we'll talk about tonight, rewrite the code of life, the DNA that makes us who we are and, and is, is the, the code that controls all of the life on our planet. It's, a, it's sort of a, an astounding thing to think about. And what both of us uh, uh, want to do tonight is to tell you about the genesis of that technology for, for gene editing and uh, talk about what that enables, what that means for the future, both the near-term and long-term future, and the awesome opportunities and challenges that we, have to, we, we now have in front of us that I think are both very exciting but also um, uh, require careful thought 
to think about responsible progress. And the story really begins with thinking about uh, the structure of DNA, because if we go back to the 1950s when the double helical structure was first discovered, it opened the door to a lot of modern biology because scientists for the first time understood the chemistry underlying life. They could read the code and start to ask questions about how this code operates in all cells, in all organisms. And since then, it's been possible to understand, we now have the, the DNA sequence for the entire human genome. Think about that, it's amazing. And also the genomes for many other organisms, plants, animals, bacteria, fungi. Increasingly, we understand uh, how that code is used in cells to control the way they develop and become certain types of, of organisms, how they have, uh, how these organisms have the properties that they do, and even much more detailed things like what genes are responsible for human diseases or what genes are responsible for human traits. And so the, the potential to be able to not only look at the code and, and try to understand what it means, but also to go in and tinker with it, change it, is, is, is really, is truly enticing. And it's really this uh, question that's been, I think, grappled with really for at least uh, several decades, thinking about scientists asking, what if you could actually edit the DNA in a cell, much like we would edit the text of a document? And the idea would be, what if you could erase some of the sequence? What if you could replace it? What if you saw a typo somewhere in the code and you could uh, you had a tool that would allow you to accurately correct that sequence. This is not a, a, a new idea. It really goes back to, like I said, I think really to the discovery of the DNA structure. I can remember as a graduate student in the 1980s learning about research that was going on in chemistry labs that were using methods that would allow cutting DNA at a precise place in the human genome, and while I was working, at doing my graduate work at the Massachusetts General Hospital in, in Boston, a scientist there, Jim Gusella, was able to actually use a technique like that to map the gene that causes Huntington's disease, a very severe neurological disorder. It was one of the first genes to be, you know, mutations to be mapped that way that gave scientists an insight into the genetic basis for disease, but in those days, it was very hard. There wasn't really good, robust technology for how you would actually be able to correct a mutation like that. So now, uh, fast forwarding uh, to, to the present day, there have been a series of technologies that have come along, especially in the last few years, for editing DNA, being able to make precise changes to the DNA in cells. But the one that we're gonna talk about tonight comes uh, from a very interesting line of research that was not intended to create a technology originally. It was curiosity-driven science that was asking a question about how bacteria fight viral infection. And that line of research led to uncovering the actions of molecules that are part of this CRISPR bacterial immune system that allowed scientists to harness that capability for a very different purpose, namely for altering the DNA in cells in a precise fashion. And that's what I wanna, wanna tell you about in the next couple of minutes, is how does that actually work? And so when a, when a virus infects a cell, and here you're seeing a cartoon of a, a virus, it almost looks like a lunar lander, uh, landing on the surface of a bacterial cell, the infection begins by that virus injecting its genetic material into the cell to take over and begin making more viruses. And in this example, you can see a, a piece of DNA that's coming out of the virus and it's going into the cell. If the cell is a bacterial cell, that cell has only 20 minutes before it will be uh, broken apart and more virus particles will burst uh, forth and infect other cells. So there's a very short window of time for the bacterium to defend itself from the infection. Now in cells that have a CRISPR bacterial immune system, these cells have a way of acquiring DNA sequences from the virus, storing them in the genetic material of the bacterium, 
and then using them for, to, uh, in a seek and destroy mechanism that allows the cell to find and cut viral DNA should it appear in the cell again. And the way that that works is through a protein that's known as Cas9. Now this uh, picture here is, is a 3D printed model of this protein. Now, the protein is obviously very, very tiny. We can't actually see it with our eyes, but we can visualize it using a technique called X-ray crystallography. And this, this 3D printed model is using coordinates for the atoms in the protein and the RNA and DNA that it's holding onto that we get from X-ray crystallography. And then we can feed those to a 3D printer and print out this model. So this model sits in my office at Berkeley. It's about uh, yay big or so. And, uh, and in, uh, what you can see here is the white protein holding on to an orange molecule, which is the program for the enzyme. It's, an R, it's a molecule called RNA. It's a little transient copy of a viral sequence from the bacterium that will tell this protein where to go, what DNA sequence it should find and cut. And in this model, it's holding on to a piece of DNA, the blue double helix, that has a sequence of letters matching the sequence of the orange RNA. When that match occurs, the protein holds the DNA, opens the two strands of the double helix, and then has chemical scissors that come in and make a cut. They make a double-stranded break in the DNA. And for bacteria, that's a terrific way to seek and destroy viruses that would otherwise cause infections that would kill the cell. But once Emmanuel Charpentier, my collaborator, and I figured out the mechanism of this enzyme, we realized that it could be harnessed for a very different purpose. And that is because in animal and plant cells, when cells experience a double-stranded break to DNA, something that happens naturally during cell division and sometimes due to DNA damage that happens, the cell has a very sophisticated way of detecting that break and fixing it. And in the process of fixing it, a change to the DNA sequence can be introduced. And scientists have ways of controlling. We can actually uh, uh, find ways to induce the cell to repair DNA, either by making a small disruption to the DNA sequence, or by inserting or integrating a new piece of genetic material at the site of the break. And that was not something that, that was something that has been known for, for a while about the way that cells repair DNA. And so what has been appreciated for the past few years is that if there were a way to introduce a break in DNA in the genome at a particular place where a change was desired, that would trigger this kind of repair process that could lead to efficient gene editing. And the challenge was how do you, how do you program a break in DNA at a place where you want to trigger a change? And that's where CRISPR-Cas9 comes in. It's an enzyme that does exactly that. It can be programmed to cut DNA at a desired sequence. So let me show you a little video that uh, illustrates how we imagine that this enzyme, this bacterial enzyme Cas9 with its guide RNA, operates when it gets into an animal or a plant cell. And so here we're zooming into a, to a, a plant cell or an animal cell where the DNA is inside the nucleus. And not only that, the DNA is highly packaged. So it's wrapped around green proteins called histones to form structures that allow the DNA to be highly compacted. And somehow this Cas9 enzyme with its guide RNA is able to seek a search through the whole uh, genome and find a sequence of DNA matching the sequence of the guiding RNA. When that match occurs, the DNA unwinds inside the protein, the chemical cleavers make a cut, and then the broken ends of the DNA are handed off to repair enzymes that can fix the break, sometimes by integrating a new piece of DNA and new, new genetic information at the site of the break. So it's truly a phenomenal process that gives scientists now this precision tool for altering the DNA sequence in cells. And remarkably, this enzyme, which comes from bacteria, works in virtually every type of cell or organism where it's been tested. And that means that human beings now have this awesome 
technology for altering the DNA sequence in ways that could allow us to correct the causes of genetic diseases and, and of course to do all sorts of research that has been enabled by the convergence of this technology with also the abilities to synthesize DNA very inexpensively and also to sequence DNA inexpensively. And those are technologies that are all coming together right now that allow us to manipulate the genetic uh, material, the code of life, in ways that even a few years ago, none of us could have imagined being sort of a reality. So this is a, a, a picture that uh, illustrates some of the different kinds of organisms that have been modified using CRISPR-Cas9. And you can see on this slide that we have animals, we have insects, we have various kinds of plants, we have uh, organisms that are important commercially, agriculturally, that are important for research, and of course we have uh, human cells as well. So it's a wide range of opportunities for scientists now to use this technology to alter the DNA sequence in cells and organisms that, in ways that have accelerated the pace of research. If nothing else, that's a, you know, just an awesome thing that we've seen the in increase in the, um, the, the scale and the, and, the, and the number of scientific publications that have been generated just using this kind of technology. And we can already see opportunities on the horizon for using this in uh, various ways that will be important commercially, but certainly also very important for uh, biomedicine. I thought I would just give you a few, a few examples, a few sort of concrete ideas for how this is going to be a technology that will change all of our, our lives in various ways. And the first one really comes as an example of something that research that's going on in my own laboratory. So one of the things that happened after the work that I did with Emmanuel on the original curiosity-driven science about CRISPR-Cas9 and how it works was the idea that we could collaborate with clinical colleagues, and for me in the Bay Area, that's the University of California, San Francisco, our local medical school, to figure out how we could deliver these gene editing molecules into cells of the brain. Because one very exciting opportunity with this technology is that one day we may be able to correct genetic mutations that lead to disease. So I mentioned Huntington's disease earlier. Now this is one of the neurological disorders for which there's a well-defined genetic cause. And so the opportunity to use gene editing to correct that mutation is, is really a very, very exciting one. And what I'm showing you on the slide is an experiment that was done by a postdoc in, in the lab, uh, Brett Stahl, who was able to inject modified versions of the CRISPR-Cas9 protein that had been chemically altered so they can enter neurons. They're able to actually get inside of neuro, uh, neuronal cells he injects these into the brain of a mouse, and we're doing this in a system in a mouse where editing of the DNA in these cells turns the cells red. And so we have a very nice visual way to look at editing that occurs. And I want you to notice in the panel on the right that when, this, when these injections are done on both sides of the brain, we get a very nice volume of tissue in the brain that gets edited. And so we, we know that we have a technology now that allows precise changes to be made just in the cells that receive these editing tools. And this is something that I think holds a lot of opportunity in the future for uh, potentially curing diseases that in the past were completely intractable, for which we didn't have any, any hope to offer to, to patients. Another, uh, ex I think, very interesting direction for CRISPR-Cas9 technology is in agriculture. I like to say that, you know, when I think about what the impact will be on, uh, on our, our planet, I guess, you know, for sort of thinking about uh, opportunities for uh, humankind, I think the biggest in, uh, impact in the short term certainly will be in agriculture. And this is an example of research that was done at a laboratory, uh, an academic laboratory that was investigating how gene editing could be used in tomato plants to create plants that can bear more fruit. And in, in the matter of a few weeks, this lab was able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to change genes in tomatoes that create plants capable of bearing three times more fruit 
than the, the starting plant. So I'm a tomato farmer, so I, I think that's very, very interesting uh, sort of example of, of use of gene editing, but I think there will be ways to use this that will also have very exciting impacts in terms of creating plants that are tolerant to drought, uh, resistant to disease, and that potentially are, are, uh, have higher nutrition levels. And to do that in ways that don't require plant breeders to introduce many random mutations, as they currently do, to create uh, desire, plants with desired traits, but instead to do the, these, uh, these genetic alterations in a very precise fashion that allows just the change that's desired to be introduced. Another interesting uh, development with, with CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing has been thinking about how to uh, use this in animals in ways that will be beneficial. So there are opportunities in uh, animals that are important agriculturally, of course, but I'm showing you this picture of piglets because one of the, one of the developments that's happened in the last year is work that's being done to create pigs that will be, in principle, better organ donors for, for humans by using the CRISPR gene editing technology to remove viruses from pigs that would otherwise have the potential to infect people, and also to create pigs that have organs that are more human-like, so they won't be rejected by humans when they get uh, transplanted. So that's something that you know, even a short while ago, no one would have imagined the, the uh, ability to really do that in a way that would be, uh, that would be uh, you know, medically and commercially viable. And then there's, there's uh, you know, this, this sort of brings us to uh, uh, something I want to point out about different kinds of gene editing that can be done. So for a lot of the research that's going on right now, that gene editing happens in what we call somatic cells. These are cells that are fully differentiated in an, or, in a, in an animal or, or, or a plant, and, and they, don't, uh, they don't end up uh, leading to changes that would be transmitted to future generations. But what if we do editing in germ cells? This is an example that shows a pipette tip holding a fertilized mouse egg. So this is a, a mouse embryo that is being injected from the other side by a needle that carries the Cas9 uh, protein with its guide RNA. And we know that when this kind of editing is done and changes are introduced to DNA at this very early stage of development in germ cells, or, or in these early embryos, that those changes become part of the entire organism and they can be transmitted to future generations. And so I, I wanted to show you an example of the precision of this kind of editing by showing you uh, an experiment that was done by a, a, a student at MD Anderson uh, University in, uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And this is an experiment in which the student was working with frog embryos. These are two cell embryos in which the, there are literally two cells inside this uh, very early developing uh, frog. And she injected into one of the two cells the CRISPR-Cas9 protein with its guide RNA and a gene that encodes uh, a green protein, a green fluorescent protein. And the way she did this editing allowed her to remove a gene that is important for brown color in the frog and replace it with this green fluorescent protein. And you can see that every embryo that received that injection in one of its two cells now has a green fluorescent cell and, uh, and an unedited cell on the other side. And when these, when these embryos develop, they develop uh, into, into frogs. And here we're looking at tadpoles. You can see in the top panel that right down the center of the animal, there is a, there's a split, and the top uh, half of the animal has cells that are brown, and the bottom half is missing that, that pigment. And then if we look on the bottom image under a fluorescent light, all of the edited cells are green. So this just shows you that when you do editing in the germline like that, then all of the resulting cells that get edited pass along that edit to their progeny. So it's a very powerful tool. So I was sitting in my office at Berkeley in uh, early 2014, uh, and I got a phone call from a reporter who said, what do you think about the latest work with CRISPR-Cas9 using it to change the DNA in monkeys? 
and I was uh, astounded. I, I, I got a hold of the, the research article that this reporter was referring to, and it was talking about work that was being published in an academic journal that reported using CRISPR-Cas9 in embryos of monkeys that were then, uh, trans that were then uh, implanted into female monkeys. They, females gave birth to these edited uh, animals, and they turned out to be normal monkeys that had a single genetic change in the DNA that was uh, sort of a proof of principle that you could do this kind of editing, not only in uh, in sort of uh, animals that we use for, for uh, uh, investigating human disease in the lab, like mice and rats, but also in, uh, in these uh, animals that are much closer to human beings, like monkeys. And I have to admit that I was pretty, um, I was pretty affected by that, that, that phone call in that paper, and it really made me start to think about the possibility that people might already be thinking about or even starting to do gene editing in human embryos, because it seemed likely that if it works in, uh, in animals like monkeys and, and other animals, that this would be something, there was no reason to think that it wouldn't also work in human embryos. So this uh, really was, for me, uh, the, the uh, moment when I decided that I really needed to start t discussing publicly the research that I and my colleagues were doing, not that we were doing this kind of work ourselves, but just understanding that the technology that I had been involved in developing was something that had this awesome power and potential and could be used for wonderful things that, that I think we would all agree can improve human life, but also had the potential to be used for things like eugenics, uh, you know, altering the, the, the human, uh, sort of the human population in ways that might have uh, undesired or unintended consequences. And so that led to a series of meetings that happened initially in, uh, in the U.S. and now increasingly internationally to discuss this opportunity and also has, of course, led to a lot of media attention around this. I think it's an idea that is very captivating uh, to people, you know, to think about, uh, gee, how could I, uh, you know, how would I like to tweak uh, the genome, my genome or my kid's genome? And, uh, I, I recently asked my, my, my teenage son, you know, about, uh, I said, you know, what do you think about gene editing? Do you think you would ever want to use that uh, when, you, when you have kids? And he said, Mom, of course. And so, <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's an interesting thing. I think it's just a, it's a moment when uh, we are all sort of faced with, we're sort of on the verge of a technology that's going to offer that potential. And we have to figure out, is that a place that we want to go, and if we, if we go there, how do we do it in a responsible fashion? Uh, this is a report that was published just about a year ago by the National Academy of Sciences in the, in the U.S. that was spearheaded by a meeting that had happened the year before, an international meeting that was co-sponsored by the Royal Society in the United Kingdom and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So these three groups got together and put on an international meeting to discuss, in particular, human germline editing leading to this report. And if you read it, it's a publicly available document, if you have a look at it, it basically um, outlines the potential for this technology to alter the human germline and ways that that could be utilized in the future. And it makes a recommendation, which is that scientists refrain from using this in a clinical way, so in, in other words, to do uh, work that would lead to uh, the birth of a CRISPR-edited baby until there's an opportunity for real uh, public discussion and disclosure and transparent conversations with many stakeholders, not just among scientists and clinicians, but really among a much broader uh, swath of humanity to think through the implications of a tool uh, and a technology like this. And I would say that those conversations are very much ongoing, but at the same time, the technology and the desire to use it in different ways, of course, is racing ahead. And we've seen just in the last few months publication in very prominent uh, scientific journals work that is doing research in viable human embryos using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology that could enable removal of genes that would cause genetic disease. And it's spurred a lot of uh, discussion and ongoing uh, questions about not only the te technical aspects of the technology, how it's working, but also the bigger sort of uh, more societally based questions about 
should we go there and how do we ensure that this technology is used responsibly? How do we ensure that people understand what's coming and what's going to be affecting our world uh, going forward? And I'll really look forward to our, our, our discussion after the talks about that. I just want to close by mentioning that uh, with a graduate student in my lab, Sam Sternberg, we wrote a book called A Crack in Creation, which talks about our experience. It's a very just personal uh, story of going through the, the process of doing the research that led to uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and then thinking through where it's going in the future. What does this mean and how does it change the world that we live in and what do we imagine happening in the future? How do we engage in the kinds of public discussions that are so critical uh, right now? And finally, I'll just mention that I've also been involved in the Bay Area in, in uh, establishing the Innovative Genomics Institute, an academic uh, organization that's uh, under the umbrella of the University of California Berkeley and the University of California San Francisco. We are an organization that does uh, research using gene editing but really importantly also has a big effort in ethics and outreach. We have a team of people that are working on ways to educate non-scientists about what gene editing is, what does it enable, and where is it going in the future? And trying to, we're working with uh, groups like high school teachers to help them develop tools and, and, and uh, kits they can use with their students to educate them about this and where it's going. So it's a, it's a very exciting uh, opportunity right now. And I would encourage any of you that are interested to check us out on the web. Uh, I'd like to uh, conclude at this point and thank you for your attention and I definitely look forward to our, our conversation after the talks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jennifer, very much. And I'm looking forward to your discussion as well because, of course, what does conversation, what does a dialogue around this technology actually look like? Is it one way? Is it a scientist talking to you about the benefits and the potential risks of a technology or is it a two-way exchange? And that's certainly the concern of our next speaker, also a giant in the field. Assistant Professor Kevin Asfelt is director of what's called the Sculpting Evolution Group at a very interesting institution, MIT's Media Lab. It's quite an unusual setting for a man with his research background to have landed in, and that is interesting in itself. A very powerful combination, I suspect. And he's focused in his group on inventing new ways to study and influence the evolution of ecosystems, but also to engage communities on the technologies that they're developing. He's worked alongside CRISPR trailblazers at Harvard, and other institutions from his graduate student days. He's become a trailblazer himself. He's credited as the first to describe how CRISPR, combined with what are called gene drives, and this is work that's happening in Australia right now too, how they could be used to genetically engineer wild populations of plants and animals. Now, this is a very big deal in a country like ours, a big, vast island with invasive and pest species, the cane toad for example. But he's also working on ways to make that technology safe because as you can imagine, you unleash a gene drive into a natural environment, what happens? He's trying to work on ways to keep that localised. Please welcome Kevin Esfeld. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And it is really deeply humbling, of course, to follow Jennifer, who, in addition to the many tremendous things that she's done, so clearly feels the weight of moral responsibility for the consequences of the technologies that she's played a role in. And that's why we scientists should be deeply concerned by how well we can predict the consequences of what we do. Because if you take a look around here, just how I'm speaking to all of you, this building, everything, the way we live today has been so profoundly shaped by technology. It's probably fair to say that the future of our civilization will primarily be determined by the technologies that we invent and the wisdom with which we deploy them or refrain. 
So how, as scientists, should we be going about this? For that matter, please raise your hand if you have done some form of research. Come on. OK, yeah, so we have a lot of us here. So how do you know that your work might be at risk? Well, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the webcomic XKCD, but the author of that webcomic decided to help us out. And here we have a plot of different fields of science. This is everything from astronomy to molasses storage, which is an inner, inner, inner city Boston joke. But it plots everything by the risk that your research will be used by a supervillain for world domination against the risk that your research will, the subject of your research will escape from the laboratory and threaten the local population. Now, when I saw this, I thought, wow, okay, this explains why I'm so concerned. Because in my laboratory, of course, we work on genetic engineering, microbiology, and to do that, we work with a lot of robotics. And, well, yeah, okay. But I'm actually not quite so sure that genetic engineering deserves its pride of place in the upper right corner there. And the reason is something that Charles Darwin said. He said, man selects for his own good, nature for that of the being which she tends. And what he means by that is, of course, when we alter an organism, we're doing so for our benefit, and we're diverting its resources from the ability to reproduce in its natural habitat. Meaning, if we release a selectively bred organism or a CRISPR-edited organism into the wild, it will be outcompeted by its wild counterparts almost every time. But there are, of course, genetic elements in the wild, natural genetic elements, that can spread through populations even if they don't help the organisms reproduce. These are called gene drive systems. The phenomenon is gene drive, and it's completely ubiquitous. By current estimates, more than half of our own DNA comprises broken remnants of gene drive systems of a particular kind. And it's nearly impossible to find a sequence genome that doesn't have gene drive remnants somewhere in it. But with CRISPR now, we can harness gene drive and potentially make organisms in the lab that then, if released, would spread that change through wild populations, thereby affecting entire ecosystems. So I would say that wherever genetic engineering is, gene drive is further up and to the right. So how does it work? Well, if we deliver into the reproductive cells of an organism the DNA change that we want to make in that organism, we also deliver in CRISPR components and guide RNAs. But if you want to build a gene drive, you encode the CRISPR system and the instructions for making the change into the DNA that you're going to insert next to the change you want to spread. So you put this into the cell, it produces the CRISPR components, cuts the target site on the genome, inserts your new sequence. So now, this organism's genome has the instructions for using CRISPR on its own, meaning it's going to continue to produce the CRISPR components, it's going to cut the other chromosome and copy itself over. Now here's where the magic happens. When this organism mates, now it has two edited copies, so all of its offspring are guaranteed to inherit one. And in those offspring, in their reproductive cells, editing happens again. CRISPR cuts the original version, replaces it with the new one. Meaning, when these organisms mate, all of their offspring will inherit. And editing happens again, and again, and again, and again. So again, this is a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's called a homing-based gene drive system. But with CRISPR, we can harness it. When we first pointed this out a few years ago, we did so before we actually tested it in the lab, which is pretty controversial. You don't normally do that. We could have been wasting people's time. But as it turns out, it really does work. And now it's been demonstrated in several different organisms. What might we want to do with this? Well, I confess when a, in that original paper we suggested quite a lot of potential uses of this, but I've changed my mind about some of them. I think that this form of gene drive, which is called a self-propagating gene drive because it can spread itself indefinitely, is really only well-suited for a handful of applications. And I want to highlight a few of them here. The first is malaria. Now, in the time I've been speaking, malaria has infected some 10 to 20, 10,000 people and it's killed five children just in the time that I've been speaking. 
out of the 3,500 species of mosquito in the world, three of them are responsible for the majority of malaria cases. So if we use the gene drive system to either alter those mosquitoes so that they couldn't transmit malaria or suppress the population, and this one is probably more reliable, by spreading genes such that if a mosquito inherits two copies, it's infertile, that will suppress the population to a level that is low enough that malaria transmission won't be able to be sustained. So combined with conventional measures like bed nets and malaria treatments, we might be able to eradicate the disease forever. And this project is being led by Austin Burt, who first described the possibility that homing-based gene drive might be harnessed. And they have some incredibly promising mosquito strains. Not evolutionarily stable yet, but the point being, it's not the technical barriers in the way right now. Schistosomiasis. It's the worst of the neglected tropical diseases. You wade into fresh water, it's a little blood fluke, it burrows through your skin, infects you, it can be lifelong if not treated appropriately, and schistosomiasis, in the time I've been speaking, has infected probably some 12,000 people, and it's killed one child. It also causes cognitive growth stunting. So it's, it's a pretty nasty disease, but schistosomes are sexually reproducing, and there's a lot of gene flow between them, meaning that we could suppress the schistosome population with a gene drive directly, and combined with treatments, we might be able to eradicate this disease. And finally, of course, this is Australia, right? You're familiar with organisms that have all sorts of nasty toxins and things like that in, in the environment, right? You're famous for that. But I would have to say that we in the Americas have the world champion when it comes to a species that, whose very life cycle is a moral atrocity. This is the New World screwworm, Cochleomyia hominivorax, the man devourer. And graphic image warning, what this thing does is it lays its eggs in open wounds, of mammals specifically. And unlike most maggots, which only devour dead tissue, these ones eat the healthy tissue. And they release a pheromone that calls more screwworm flies. So the animal ends up being eaten alive by flesh-eating maggots. This does happen to some people, so we know just how agonizing it is. It is so agonizing that in order to treat a patient, doctors typically have to give them morphine first. So right now, at this very moment, probably billions of mammals are infested with these screwworm flies and are suffering horrendous agony. With gene drive, we could potentially do something about it. What's also noteworthy is that this species is absent from North America because we already eradicated it. But it's more entrenched in South America. Should we continue that process? If we're going to think about it, though, we need to be careful, because the first rule of working with biology, as no doubt many of you are familiar, is that we don't understand everything. And that's especially true when it comes to ecosystems. And when you're trying to engineer a complex system you don't completely understand, we should at least be humble enough to admit that we can't completely predict what's going to happen. We might have an idea, but it's never going to be perfect. And so I have two operational rules. Number one, you always want to make the smallest possible change that can solve the problem, because then hopefully that will have the fewest possible side effects. Rule number two is you want to start small and only scale up if warranted. And it's this second rule that is a problem, because how do you start small with a self-propagating gene drive? We recently ran some mathematical models of alteration drive systems and found that they appear to be incredibly invasive. It takes very few organisms to invade a new population. And under most conditions, you release them into one population. If there's even a little bit of gene flow, it invades the next and the next and the next. So you probably can't run a field trial of this. If we could control the effects, if we could ensure that it can't propagate itself forever, then we might be able to run a field trial and see what happens at a small scale. We might also be able to potentially solve problems without affecting many nations at the same time. So how do you do that? Well, our current best idea is what's called a daisy drive. And we call it that because we take a CRISPR-based gene drive and we separate the components and scatter them across different chromosomes. And they're linked in a daisy chain. So element C has the instructions telling CRISPR to cut the wild-type locus for element B, thereby copying it. B has the instructions that cause A to be copied. But there's nothing here 
that causes C to be copied. C is a normal engineered gene, meaning it's never going to increase in the population. In fact, it's probably only, go, only going to go, to go down. So if you have C remain constant, B goes up, and the more B goes up, then A goes up. But of course, in reality, natural selection is dragging all of these down because natural selection has no mercy. So the net effect is kind of like a multi-stage rocket. That is, you increase the frequency of each stage proportional to how far it is down along the chain. And as you progressively lose elements from the chain, then it effectively runs out of fuel and starts going down until it eventually vanishes. In other words, this is a transient, potentially localized gene drive system. And it's also one where we can control the geographic area of effect, according to models, by changing the power of the drive system. You add more elements, it takes them longer to run out of them, or just by controlling the number of organisms that we release into the environment. So our hope is that Daisy Drive might provide a way to solve many more problems that you really could never get many different countries to agree upon for a self-propagating drive. You could also solve problems with things like invasive species where you really don't want to use a self-propagating drive because it could spread to the native population. I'm particularly excited, of course, by public health applications, but also animal well-being. We could substantially reduce the suffering that goes on in nature and also even within our cities. We could save endangered species by controlling invasive ones. And even in agriculture, instead of relying on chemical poisons, to kill the pests that would otherwise eat our food, we could instead program the pests to dislike the taste and otherwise go about their normal ecological roles. It's a potential way to use the language of nature as written in DNA to solve ecological problems rather than using poisons and bulldozers. The question, of course, is should we do it? And here I'm going to invoke the Australian philosopher Peter Singer. So Peter, in many ways, founded the animal rights movement, but he's also famous for his parable of the drowning child, which says, suppose you're walking along, you're wearing expensive clothes, and you see a drowning child in a lake. Should you jump in and save the child? And most people say, well, yes, of course. What kind of a horrible person do you think I am? Of course I would jump in to save a child for the cost of my expensive suit. And Peter then says, okay, well, then why aren't you willing to sell your suit and donate that money to save a child in need on the other side of the world? Why do you value that child's life less than this one right in front of you? Which is a great way to show us all what, what terrible people we actually are. So I love this parable for a different reason, which is to say, most of us think we should save the drowning child, right? But we didn't throw the child in the lake, or at least I hope you didn't throw the child in the lake but we still feel obligated to save them, even though we didn't cause the problem. But no one expects us to jump in and save the child unless we know how to swim. And I think that in this case, gene drive and other technologies, developing them is like learning how to swim. It gives us the power to intervene, and as soon as we have that power, we become morally responsible. We take on those moral obligations. We know that humans have a cognitive bias called loss aversion that makes us reluctant to intervene. And we have this idea that if we don't do anything, we can stand still. But I hate to say it, civilization is not sustainable. If we stop inventing stuff, we don't get to stand still. Things will fall apart. And similarly, if we don't intervene in many existing problems, they will just get worse. So we need to take that into account when we make these kinds of decisions because we are morally responsible for all of the suffering that we could have prevented and chose not to. That said, when it comes to making decisions, the decisions about how to use a technology are profoundly and fundamentally shaped by how we go about developing that technology. And here is where I think gene drive must be done differently. Because traditional science is what one might call closeted. That is, researchers, we don't tell other people what we're, what we're doing. And the reason, of course, is we're afraid that if we share our brilliant idea, then someone with more resources is going to go and get it working first, and they're going to publish, and they're going to get all the credit, and we're going to get none. And from my perspective, maybe I can take that, 
But if it was my student's brilliant idea, and then they get nothing, that could potentially doom their career. How can I possibly risk my student's career for that? On the other hand, for gene drive, there's a number of very compelling reasons why we should pre-register all gene drive experiments. Reason number one, if I'm inventing a medical technology, if I'm developing that, it shouldn't really bother you if I'm doing that behind closed doors. Because once it's developed and approved, and your doctor recommends it to you, you can always say no. Some of you can say yes, some of you can say no, and that works perfectly fine. You can opt out. If I'm developing a gene drive system, then that's intended to alter the shared environment. Once it's done, if you live there, you cannot opt out. You will be affected. So the decisions that I am making early on in development are going to eventually affect you. If I develop that in secret, I am denying you a voice in decisions that will affect you. And that's why my group pre-registers everything that we're doing that involves ecological engineering, even if it doesn't involve gene drive. We're working with the communities of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts on engineering mice that normally infect ticks with diseases such as Lyme disease, such that the mice can no longer be infected, thereby breaking the cycle of transmission. And in a couple of days, I'll be going over to Aotearoa. We've been invited by Teharenga, the Maori Biosecurity Network, to discuss the possibility of using these kinds of technologies to remove invasive mammalian predators. Of course, there's another reason why we should pre-register our gene drive experiments, which is, if we don't, why should you trust us? Seriously, why should you trust a scientist who insists on doing work on this kind of technology in secret? Especially when, if we have an accident, I believe there was something earlier about that risk of the thing you're studying escaping the laboratory and threatening the local population. Personally, I am deeply, deeply skeptical that there would be any ecological consequences if a gene drive were to be accidentally released from the laboratory. Most of them do things like change the color of the organism, at most. Change a marker that's invisible, would have no effect whatsoever. But that's ecological effect. The social reaction, I imagine, would be pretty negative. So negative that I'm pretty sure that Austin's valiant effort to develop gene drive against malaria would probably be delayed substantially, at least judging by what happened when there was a tragedy in the field of gene therapy. And if you delay, if they say there's a 1% chance that our doing gene drive research in secret will delay Austin's effort by 10 years, the expected cost in children's lives is 25,000, if there's just a 1% chance. Why take that risk? But it's the last one that I find most compelling. Because why? Why is it that we scientists don't share what we're doing from the get-go? Do we honestly think that science progresses more rapidly? I'm skeptical. And to really convey this, I have to tell you a story. And it does involve CRISPR-based gene drive. So it, it ties in pretty closely to, to the theme here. When we developed it, again, we told the world about it before we actually tried it, and then we tried it in yeast and verified that it worked. But I was corresponding with Austin, and we were trying to figure out how to raise awareness of the issue. Because what we were worried about was that everybody was then using CRISPR in a tremendous variety of organisms. What if some laboratory independently invented CRISPR-based gene drive, not realizing what a gene drive was? What if all they wanted to do was knock out both copies of a gene in their organism in a single step, and then possibly propagate that change down through their laboratory strains? That'd be a very useful genetic tool. What if somebody did that not realizing that it could spread in the wild? So we did our best to raise awareness. Too late. Somebody did it. These are brilliant, well-meaning scientists who did it. But they were developmental biologists. They didn't know what a gene drive was. There's no reason to expect them to know what a gene drive was. It's unreasonable. You have to specialize in science in order to stay at the forefront. No one else has, no one has time to do everything. So the lesson of this story is that even brilliant and well-meaning scientists cannot 
reliably anticipate the consequences of their work. The world is just too big. Because so much work is closeted, even if someone does see something wrong, we can't possibly warn them because we don't know who they are or that they're doing it at all. Finally, six years ago, no one imagined that we would have a tool that would work in so many different species in terms of editing their genomes. And certainly, no one imagined that we might be able to edit entire wild populations. I'm a huge science fiction buff. And I know a lot of other huge science fiction buffs at the MIT Media Lab. And none of us has been able to find an example anywhere in science fiction that even suggests this idea. It seems to have been completely unprecedented. And yet now we think we can do it. Which just goes to show you that our technological capabilities can increase very suddenly and in very unexpected directions. Put all this together and it's a little bit concerning. So my hypothesis is that open science will be not just faster and more efficient because we can intelligently decide to collaborate or compete based on what we know other people are working on, are interested in, and can now do. I think it will also be safer. Because if you do want to anticipate consequences, the best way to do it is to invite others to share their wisdom. So the reason why we share everything that we do all of our grant proposals are online, experiments pre-registered, is because I want as many people as possible to take a look at it and try to identify something that might go wrong that we haven't thought of. For Mice Against Ticks, someone on Nantucket who just happened to come to a town hall meeting already thought of something that none of us had thought of that might well change how the de deployment might eventually happen on that island if they decide to go forwards with it. So this really can work. People will come up with things that we have never considered and it can make things not just safer, but also more effective. But we depend on science. We need new inventions. And remember rule two of ecological engineering, start small and only scale up if warranted. So we don't want to change how all of science is done. That would be profoundly reckless and irresponsible. What we need is a small scale field trial of a more open way of doing science. So, I propose that gene drive be that field trial. If we want it to happen, we have to change the incentives for scientists working with gene drive. That means that universities who make hiring decisions, funders who fund our work, journals who publish it and thereby determine recognition, all need to get together and change the incentives for gene drive research. But that's a collective action problem. None of them wants to do it unless all of the others do, which is why Intellectual property, which is normally not something we think of as a very progressive tool, could actually be very useful because there's key intellectual property that is required to build this kind of gene drive system. If the holders of intellectual property came together and said any gene drive product needs to have been developed in the open if it's going to be licensed, then that could get the ball rolling and then the others might move along. So I think that that could end up being more important than any actual application of gene drive. Because the world is an incredibly bright and promising place, but we need to get there. I think we can do it. But we need to get there together. So when it comes to science, I think we need to open the doors, part the clouds, and let the sunlight in. Because only together can we, can we be wise. Thank you. This idea of radical transparency in science, now that terrifies a lot of scientists because it also means that your science, there's an anxiety that it might be shut down before it has the potential to really grow wings. So is that an anxiety that you share in having this very public conversation about your work? From my perspective, everyone I've talked to has said that they are more trusting of the research in knowing what is going on and being invited to have their say and make suggestions as to how it's different. Among scientists, the, most people seem to think it's a great idea. They just don't want it to start in their field. 
Well, I think Janet. the challenge will be what do you do when someone disagrees? There's something you want to do and you think it's right and you're very convinced, but somebody disagrees with you. How do you handle it? I think that's a matter of civic governance, but then gene drive is always a matter of civic governance because it is a shared impact technology. So I'm not saying that we humans have great ways of overcoming disagreements like that, but at least the debate needs to happen in public and then hopefully we can come to a decision. Maybe it will be wise. I will be watching your experiment with great interest. What if it shuts down the work? <laughs> what if Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, these communities that you're working with, or Maori communities that you meet with next week in New Zealand say, no. Then we walk away. We have to walk away. And in fact, with the Maori, we have to walk away even if they don't give any reason that makes sense in terms of scientific potential consequences. Because the Mataranga Maori traditional knowledge is adapted, it's evolved to that particular ecosystem. And so there are concerns that they might have, things that they might see that could go wrong, that they can see are wrong, but they're not going to be able to explain it in a way that we can understand that makes sense in terms of reductionist science, but I still expect it's probably a perfectly valid concern. So we're going to have to be willing to walk away if they say, no, this is inconsistent with our cultural knowledge. So that's very interesting. Jennifer, have you shared some of the anxieties about this public dialogue that you've initiated beyond science and scientists? Uh, how do you mean anxiety? Uh, well, an anxiety that, that the work, everyone goes straight to the embryo conversation. And in fact, there's a whole lot of other stuff that's interesting and not as risky and raises very different ethical questions before we get to the embryo and therapeutic end of things. Yeah, well I think it's, I think it's valuable to have all the, that whole range of discussions and the reason is that I think it's great to engage people in, in science. I mean, it's really exciting to see all of you here tonight, for example, because I think you know, you're here because you're interested in hearing about this, this interesting science and thinking about what it means for the future. And each of us may have a different perspective on what we think is going to be the, you know, how, how this science might affect our own lives, for example. But I think it's all, all of it plays into this you know, public interest that I think is so important to cultivate. This is a really unique opportunity to ask a question of these incredible scientists. So please, thank you very much. Hi, this is a question for uh, Professor Dudna. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Doudna. Doudna, pardon me. Close. So theoretically speaking, is it uh, possible to correct um, severe genetic disorders such as albinism? And in doing so, would one need to synthesize melanin? So I think, I think for, for your, uh, gene editing to have an impact in genetic disease, at least in the short term, we're looking at, at diseases that have a well-defined single genetic cause. And, um, and you know, there's, there's uh, actually quite a large number of those in the human population, but then there's a much larger collection of d diseases that have multigenic causes, and those will take, you know, the, the, it'll, it'll be longer before we're able to do that. And in the case of albinism, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's something that uh, would have to be, I, I personally don't know enough about the genetics of it to tell you uh, a, a great answer to that, but just, just to say that I think in principle, being able to do that kind of genetic correction is clearly on the horizon. And what has to be grappled with is for each disease, how, is, it, is it going to be possible to do that in uh, an adult or a child, or would it be something that would have to be corrected at the level of the germline? And, um, and, and uh, there's, you know, there's different sort of considerations for both kinds of therapies right now. But uh, already there are clinical trials beginning for treatments that would, uh, that would be effective in people or, or children that already have a genetic disorder. It's amazing to me to think that that's already, we're already sort of entering a, an age when those trials will be ongoing. So it's, you know, it's something that is clearly coming. Mm. And then there's a active discussion about what we define as a disorder amongst the disability activist Indeed. community yeah. um, that might come up. Right there Hi. at the back, on the right, thanks. Hi, um, I'm just wondering uh, what you both think uh, in regards to uh, embryonic alterations. 
Um, how much have you engaged with or how concerned are you about things like uh, unequal wealth distribution and the class issues and how much you've engaged with uh, other fields like philosophy, uh, history, anthropology, sociology? Thank you for that question. And um, do we have another one over here as well? Thanks. Do you think gene drive will give power to organisms and ecosystems to give them tools to like, either adapt or overcome the consequences of climate change? Well, uh, on, the question, on the first question about equity, that's such a, an important issue. I'm really glad that you brought it up. I think that, um, to me, when I think about the global impact of gene editing, I feel that it will happen first with agriculture. And I think that's something where, in principle, this could be um, a, a very equitable kind of thing. And already there are very active programs going on to develop ways of editing organisms, plants, animals that will be adapted, then better adapted to certain niches to give better nutrition or to deal with drought and, and uh, other conditions that cause difficulties raising crops, for example. I think that's, that's one thing. It's also interesting to me that this technology, and I, you may have, hopefully you got this from the both talks that you heard, is, is relatively easy to access. It's actually distributed by a nonprofit organization that uh, will send research materials to anybody who requests them for just sort of the cost of the materials. So it's uh, something that is uh, quite a low barrier to get a hold of. And I think that means that it's, it's, uh, it's going to be possible for scientists around the world, and this is already happening, to adapt it for their own purposes. And, and I think that's also something that's, you know, it could go both ways. It could be uh, good or bad, but I think it's, you know, it has the potential at least to be very enabling to people uh, globally, not just those in certain parts of the world. And then with respect to access to healthcare, you know, this is a very active, ongoing discussion. Certainly in the U.S., we grapple with this issue right now of, you know, healthcare uh, insurance and thinking about who gets access to what, what uh, kinds of healthcare, what do you do when you have a technology that can be used to treat someone, but the cost is $500,000 a patient? Who, who should pay for that? And you know, what's, what's the value? And how do we, how do we, how do we measure that? And, and so I think you know, that the biomedical applications of, of gene editing are gonna fall initially in that category, but of course one hopes that over time there will be ways to develop uh, applications even for clinical medicine that will be uh, widely uh, useful for people and, and will not, you know, where the cost will come down over time. But that's something that clearly has to be very actively addressed. It can't just be uh, allowed to, you know, sort of to be in the domain of companies, I would mm. say. Huge issue in America if you don't have access to health insurance to cover this sort of technology yep. down the track if it did become a clinical reality then, you know, you'll have the haves and the haves nots and then, you know, the have nots will be discriminated against in all sorts of ways. Right. Huge issue. Gene uh, drives and climate change and adaptation by organisms. So this is a great question and it, the challenge is what adaptations would actually be helpful. So we're not so great at creating any given phenotypic trait if we haven't already seen it before. In fact, with CRISPR, we can, we can try it now. We can try a bunch of different combinations, but it doesn't mean we're necessarily able to adapt an organism. But if we have some examples of an organism that is succeeding in adapting, but it's, we're gonna lose most of the population before that adaptation can spread just because they aren't, they're not getting selected for strongly enough, then if it is only a couple of genetic changes, then yes, we could potentially use a gene drive, even in this case a self-propagating gene drive, potentially, to spread that adaptation rapidly through the remainder of the population and thereby rescue them. Mm -hmm. I haven't really looked at any specific cases where, where people have proposed doing this, and I'm, I'm not an ecologist myself, but I would be very surprised if cases like that don't come up. Mm, what an interesting possibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take your question, and then I'll come to you for your question in a row. Thank you. Okay, I'll be incredibly quick with you guys. Thank you for the international guests for coming. I think everyone here appreciate, appreciates it. Just want a quick question for Jennifer and maybe just an idea for Kevin. Um, Jennifer, you 
Regarding what you said about, you know, the example you gave with the tomatoes and especially the example you gave with eugenics, you know, creating babies with blue eyes and blonde hair and all these fantastic abilities, do you think that, um, or, you know, if you set that aside and then you, you've got a population of people who suffer from all sorts of cancers and, you mm -hmm. know, there's 7,000 orphan diseases out there, do you think that healthcare should take priority? So healthcare should take priority over other uses over, of the technology? Yes, over, you know, right. eugenics, you know, agriculture, etc. Okay, thank you very much. And another question? Uh, how will research on human embryos affect the respect we have for human life in her early stage of development? That is, if many human embryos will be destroyed in this research, do you think the end justifies the means? Well, for the first question, I, I would I would say that my thinking there is that is that um, I think for again going back to to a point I made earlier, I think that having gene uh, having the ability to do gene editing in plants has the potential to have huge health impacts on people, much more broadly than individually treating patients. Um, if you're just thinking about numbers, right? And so I think that that's something that at least in the shorter term, is going to have a larger impact. And I would, I would myself um, prioritize that kind of work. But the hype around that's been with us since the Green Revolution. Yes. That we would feed the world with yes. genetic engineering techniques. Yep. Yep. It's, we, we're not feeding the world. No, but we, 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 uh, we, have, uh, we have increasing challenges, I would argue, in that regard, right? We've got a growing population we, we're facing uh, the effects of climate change and to have the ability now to make modifications to plants that don't require years of breeding and to do that accurately I think is, uh, you know, it's a, it, it opens the door to doing things that in the recent past were not possible. Um, and I just want to make one other comment about that question and that is that, you know, I, I certainly think that we would want to, in terms of health, you know, the clinical uh, applications, that we would want to prioritize uses for uh, diseases where there, you know, were things that we would all agree are, are, are uh, you know, desirable to fix. So for people that have degenerative neurological disorders or that have uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis or muscular dystrophy, these are de diseases that are in principle uh, treatable or potentially even curable using gene editing. And I, I think we, you know, that's something that should clearly be prioritized. At the same time, we have to be grappling with the reality that when you have a gene editing technology like this, that it, 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 you know, it can be used for other things like enhancements and whatever we would, however you would define that. And so um, I, I think it's critical not to put that discussion on a shelf, but actually to be talking about that right now, because that technology is clearly right on the doorstep. Mm, mm. If I might interject on that one, I've sometimes been criticized for suggesting that we should think primarily about applications such as malaria for gene drive, and that we shouldn't necessarily risk taking a hit to, in terms of public support should something go wrong on something else. That is to say, the earliest applications of a new technology are critical, and we should mm -hmm. absolutely prioritize those ones where everyone can agree that the problem exists and is severe because otherwise you run the risk of things turning out like people's suspicion of GMO foods. I mean, honestly, how, what have GMO foods done for anyone in this room? Like, yes, food, food is very slightly cheaper, but it, that's hardly something obvious. So I would say we should, whenever possible with a new technology, prioritize things that everyone can agree is, a, is an obvious and severe problem. So this distinction between using CRISPR for um to treat patients who are adults and have, you might be able to then infuse them with gene edited cells and, and so fix what they, what's ailing them versus do we start at the embryo stage and genotype an embryo, understand what risks are being conferred by its genetic makeup and then edit at the embryo stage. Well, that's, that's a question that's come up a lot for this audience in the questions that you sent earlier. So I think it also taps into this woman's question as well. Um, do we go anywhere near embryos? 
Well, uh, we're, we're already going there. You know, it, it, people are already doing, doing research on embryos. It didn't start with gene editing, though. You know, it started with, I would argue, with uh, in vitro fertilization and all of the technology that went into that. And, um, and with something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, which is now done routinely to screen uh, human embryos for, and also animals, but humans, uh, human embryos for genetic disease prior to implantation. And so, and that's something that is now offered to people that are using in vitro fertilization uh, quite routinely. And I'm, you know, I'm old enough to remember back before there was in vitro fertilization, before and after, you know, and I remember debates in my family growing up about, you know, my, my parents saying, well, that, you know, that seems wrong, you know, why should people be, you know, making babies in a test tube and test tube babies, and there was lots of discussion about that, and it seemed really wrong uh, to, to certain people. And, and then over time, when it appeared that, you know, Louise Brown was born and, and she appeared normal and other parents who were otherwise infertile were able to be able to help to, to, uh, to have children, uh, people over time came to accept it. And I think now, uh, at least in many parts of the world, that technology is widely accepted. Will the same thing happen with uh, modification of the human germline using gene editing? I don't know, but I, 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 think, I think we will see evolution of people's thinking about this as the technology, uh, you know, advances. And I would also point out that I think that uh, in the not distant future, I don't, I can't tell you exactly when because, it, you know, it's very much on the sort of the bleeding edge of technology right now, but I think at some point it will become possible to do the editing in germ cells. So that means in sperm or eggs rather than in embryos. Mm. And that sort of removes this whole, I think, for many people, ethically difficult issue of, you know, do you really want to be working with embryos that then have to be discarded? It feels uncomfortable in many ways. And, and so I think if we could be doing editing in germ cells, uh, the, the sperm or eggs, and then selecting those cells that have the correct uh, edits, desired edits, and then using those for, uh, for fertilization, then I think that's, that's a, a potentially a more appealing way of using germline editing in the future. And we're not, like I said, we're not there today, but I do think the technology is moving uh, very steadily towards that, that moment. And we should point out that most of the work that's being done on embryos, they're non-viable embryos, so they will never be implanted, they will never become a baby <laughs> as such. But what that's allowing is scientists like those at the Crick Institute who have just published to understand the development of what genes are involved in development. And that's vital, isn't it, for understanding humans and our biology? It is, yeah. yeah. Did you want to add anything on that, Kevin? Well, I just like to say that I don't touch human editing stuff because I don't like doing anything controversial. There you go. <laughs> no, nothing controversial, my foot. Okay, so could we go to the back and then over to this side? So that one over there. Um, thank you. So in order to make Gene Drive a pioneering example in open science, um, I think you have to do more than just make the information and the experiments and the suggestions available. You, you actually have to make people want to read them. So how can we make the shift to a more scientifically literate society that's actually engaged in these things, and how long do you think that will take? Okay, and thank you. Uh, thank you both for your work and your talks. It's really great to be here. Just addressing two of the concerns that have come up tonight around human gene editing, um, genetic haves and have-nots, and also just concerns about changing human nature. Uh, there's another biological technology vaccinations that initially were only available to developed wealthy countries. Do you think in the future thinking will evolve and it will, like nobody now thinks that vaccinations are a bad idea, well, nobody scientifically literate <laughs> thinks it's a bad idea, um, and they save countless lives. Uh, are we gonna go in the same direction or are there, are there important differences between these two technologies? I'm not going to repeat those questions. So the first one, though, was looking, if we want to engage with open science and make gene drives the case study, how do we better engage the wider community in science and scientific understanding? Well, I think Convergent Science Network and events like this one are certainly helping. But I think a critical aspect is inviting people 
to submit suggestions and share their concerns and then actually acting on them. That is, we shouldn't just tell people about what is going on as though they're passive recipients. We need to actually invite them to help shape the future because they will share in it. And I've found that we've managed to involve many, many community members who said that they were generally skeptical of science or wouldn't normally have considered this sort of thing, but if it's going to be done in the open and it's going to invite concerns from everyone and that their voice is going to be listened to, then they're very glad to participate. And I'm very glad to have them because, frankly, the people I really want joining an effort are the ones who are the most skeptical of it because they're the ones who have every reason to find something potentially wrong with it. Um, I'll come back to that. I've got another question about that. The, the vaccination question, uh, the, using that as a sort of platform for what's to come. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's an interesting example because, you know, I live, I live uh, very close to Marin County, uh, California, which is a county where there's a lot of highly educated people who reject vaccination. Now, even now, they will not vaccinate their kids. And we've seen outbreaks of measles and other things like that. Um, that, you know, that, 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 that result. And uh, I, I think it just, it speaks to the, the, the issue. It kind of actually relates to that first question of, you know, how do you engage people in, in science so that they understand enough about technologies that are coming along that are affecting our, our lives so that they can make uh, responsible and informed decisions about using uh, those technologies. I also think that people, um, you know, people's views can change over time. You know, if they're open to discussion and to, uh, to looking at uh, sort of facts and, and data and thinking about it, um, they, their, their views can change. And I, back to the in vitro fertilization example, that's an example where people, I think, initially who were skeptical or, or felt that this technology was not something that they would want to use, when they saw that it was safe and that it had a very positive impact on a number of people's lives, maybe even their own lives or someone in their family, that for them then became a transformative experience. I had a, I'll tell you a little, a very, a very brief, a little story. So I, I was, I went at one point to Congress and I was in the United States and I was um, discussing this technology and what it would mean for the future. And I was, uh, I was, uh, found myself sitting across uh, from a very conservative rookie uh, uh, first term congresswoman from the Midwest who was known for her extremely uh, con you know, socially conservative points of view. She was, uh, uh, you know, someone who uh, really did not support any of the, any of the uh, sort of new technologies and, 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 and uh, was, you know, kind of a, known as a somewhat, you know, science skeptic, I guess you could say. And, and what was fascinating, I was wondering how this, this conversation would, would go uh, between her and somebody like me, and it turned out that she had uh, given birth to a child the year before, that while it was in utero, while she was pregnant, they discovered the child was missing a kidney. And, uh, and this required them to ultimately do fetal surgery. And it was a very difficult thing. Fortunately, it had a positive outcome for her and the child. But she told me that she said, you know, if the CRISPR technology was available at that time for my child, I would not hesitate to use it. So for her, it had become a very personal thing. And so I think that it's really important that we find ways to engage with people uh, on, uh, on, a, you know, on a level that is relatable to, to their lives. And I think like what you heard from, from Kevin, I think is a very good point as well, which is that we need to ensure that some of the earliest uses of new technologies, and certainly for gene editing this is true, that we are you know, collectively selecting uh, applications that are going to be positive. They're gonna be viewed as uh, things that, that are solving real problems, not just uh, making money for companies and things, but, but really uh, actually tackling uh, problems that people are facing in their lives. And I think if we do that as scientists, that will we'll go a long way towards um, you know, engendering goodwill and, and the willingness of people to engage with us and, and think together mm -hmm. about how we go forward uh, with, with uh, this in the future. But yeah, we could talk for hours about the commercial well, imperative versus open science, you know? I do have one brief anecdote to add, yeah. and that's yeah. just it. For Mice Against Ticks, there are some people that we've met on the islands who don't vaccinate their children and would never knowingly eat GM foods. 
and yet they're wholehearted supporters of the idea of releasing 100,000 genetically engineered mice on their island. Because they don't want Lyme disease. Because they don't want to get Lyme disease. <laughs> Lyme disease. Right. So, I'm going to take one more question, and that looks remarkably like Ellen Trouncen, but I might not be right about that. Is yeah. it Ellen Trouncen? So that's Ellen Trouncen who ah. trailblazer in IVF. <laughs> So, so Jennifer, great, great to see you. It's, it's, it is really a, an incredible technology, and I, I have every confidence that we can use this really wisely, for the for the benefit for for all kind, uh, and I have absolute confidence that we can do that. Gene drive, driving that's a different gig, I think, and 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 so. I like the idea of, of, of it being open. I, I think that's a great idea, but somehow we have to figure out how to fund all that. But what I wanted to ask you, Kevin, was isn't there ways of sort of uh, maybe introducing an antisense to recover back the population if it, if it went wrong, or uh, I insisting on putting in a suicide gene of some kind that would sort of you know, collapse that population if it was doing something that was unpredictable, and couldn't we wind those kind of things in uh, that we do in, in some medicines, uh, you know, to make sure, well, we get rid of this if it's, uh, if it's, if it's not doing good? Can't we sort of build those, those things into it? Because you're right, I, it, it does worry me that it, once it's gone and out of control, you can't stop it, and it only stops when it's fully complete. But, but you must, must be able to back it off in some way. Yeah, are there other ways other than daisy chains, uh, daisy drives, daisy chains, daisy drives, to pull it back once it's out there? So there's a lot of research going into this, um, funded by a number of different organizations. And the challenge is to make it evolutionarily stable. Because you're right, including, including a to inducible toxin or something like that, trying to include a kill switch, but then you run the question of what triggers the kill switch. Yeah. Is it an environmental chemical? Can you be sure you get all of them? How is that different from just using an insecticide to kill all of, kill all of them, et cetera? Um, but we, the thing about gene drive that really makes me quite relieved, and in fact, the first thing we tested in yeast was, of course, can you overwrite an earlier gene drive with a newer one and restore the trait that was changed by the first one? And the answer seems to be yes. And thanks to the versatility of CRISPR, because it can target so many different sequences and there's so many different CRISPR enzymes that have been isolated, it's impossible to make a sequence that is functional and yet can't be targeted with CRISPR. Meaning, no matter what anybody does with a gene drive, we can always build another gene drive to undo it. And if we can figure out something that is sufficiently localized, whether DAISY or something else, we actually have a project that builds what we call DAISY threshold drives that would be even more tightly controlled and would essentially link it to a genetic change that makes the genes go it select, causes natural selection to act against them if they're in the minority. With the idea being that then we can use this to change, to alter the ones that have been changed in undesirable ways, and then release a suppression drive specific to that particular change that would reduce the population relative to wild type. Once they were in the minority, natural selection would clean them up, and you'd remove all engineered genes from the population. And whether or not we need that, I mean, I'm actually skeptical in most cases of potential environmental damage. The reality is that many people feel that nature is sacred to them. And the notion that we would have introduced engineered genes at all bothers them on a, on a profoundly moral level. And I think we're obligated to respect that, even though I don't feel that, feel that way about it. I do feel compelled to try to develop tools that would allow us to remove all engineered genes and restore populations to the way they were initially. Mm. Um, the thing we need to be careful of is we have never before engineered something that we anticipate evolving on its own. And having worked a lot with microbial directed evolution and the like, I'm skeptical of things like kill switches just because it only takes one to escape, right? So we do need to be very careful. And even with something like Daisy Drive, the reason we're working in, with testing it in worms is because we need, evolution is a numbers game. We need to be able to grow hundreds of millions or billions of the relevant organisms and see how stable is it? What is the escape rate? And so we need organisms like worms to do that. And then the question is, how much is a worm like a mosquito or a rat? Or a cane toad. Or a cane toad. Or a cane toad. Thank you very much. And thank you for your question. Sorry we couldn't get to them all, but please spill it onto Twitter and use that hashtag and maybe the conversation can, can continue. And Kevin, I know, is active on Twitter and he might happily engage in conversation. <laughs> Sorry to put that to you. Uh, I want to um, acknowledge the sponsors of tonight's event, 
you know, 2,000 of you registered to be here. And this is not possible without these amazing people. The Club Melbourne Ambassador Program, the Victorian Department of Education and Training, the Monash Biomedicine Discovery Institute, the Gra Graham Clark Institute, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, Cartherix PTY LTD, the Faculty of Science at the University of Melbourne, the Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute, these are all Melbourne institutions, the Hudson Institute of Medical Research, and of course, your organisers of today, the Convergence Science Network, Luan and his incredible team. They would also like to acknowledge the support of the Lawn Genome Conference who brought Jennifer out, and the School of Biosciences at the University of Melbourne uh, who brought Kevin out. And thank you to them for their generosity for making them available for this event too. So please thank Jennifer Doudna and Kevin Esfeld. Thank you.